hope you are doing great today. So we are in our second week of the satisfied soul. So what we're going to be talking about is things about to be grateful, to be thankful about the Thanksgiving season, things like that. But to, today, I want to talk to you guys about contentment. Now, what what is contentment? Now, it's not just going with the flow, just easy going. But what is true contentment, right? Now, the easiest way I can think of to describe of how we describe contentment is, let's say you guys like to go eat out with your friends and stuff, right? You know, like a nice good restaurant, that kind of thing. All right, let's say you're in a group of friends. Y'all are all trying to figure out what you want to eat for dinner. Y'all are spitting out all kinds of ideas. You say McDonald's, Wendy's, one of y'all has the expensive option that nobody wants to go to. Um, but everybody's spitting out ideas. And about 75% of the group has said, you know what? Yeah, let's go to this. Let's go to this restaurant, right? But you don't want to be a burden. You're that one person. You're the one person in the group that's like, uh, I didn't really say my opinion, but I really don't want to go there. But I'm going to go with the group anyway. And then you go on your way. You all make your way to the restaurant and everything. But then you mutter under your breath, man, I really hate this place. And it can be for a multitude of reasons. But are you actually content? No. If anything, your actions show that you're anything but content, but you just may not tell everybody, right? See, contentment is not about our circumstances or what we like. We don't even have to agree with every situation that comes our way. But see, contentment, true contentment, is consistent contentment. It's being consistent through all things. See, we're going to look at Paul. We're going to continue in Philippians chapter 4. But what he's saying is that his faith, that his contentment of when he feels at ease, when he feels this peace, which is truly what contentment is, he says that this peace is not contingent on his circumstances, but is consistent through his circumstances. Whatever, he, whatever may come his way, he is consistently content, right? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4 starting in verse 10. It says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So he says the word there, content. He said in all of this and everything going on in his life, doesn't matter what comes his way, he's learned to be content. Right, But we're going to stick in these four verses here. And he lists three very specific characteristics of what it means to be consistently content in our lives. And the first is that consistent contentment is present in the highs and the lows. He says, whether I'm doing great, whether I'm on top of the world, or when, you know, it's not, not my best day, when I'm not feeling the greatest. Right? He says, you know, whatever comes my way, God's got it. He knows that God is in control of everything, and he's not even worried about it. He says he's learned in whatever situation I am to be content. See, there's nothing in this life that is going to take that contentment away from him because he's learned what it means to be content in it. Now, for us, highs and lows can mean a lot of different things, right? Maybe it's just a bad day at work. Maybe you didn't get along with somebody today. Maybe the highs are, hey, maybe you got a promotion. Hey, maybe you found that thing that you were really looking for. Maybe it was just a great day with your family. See, the highs and the lows, they don't have to be super extremes of the spectrum, but they fit everywhere in it. It doesn't matter what is going on in your life, we're called to be content. But if we continue and we look at verse 12, he writes this as he continues. He says, I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and in need. So here we're looking that he, he's gone through the highs and the lows. He knows what it's like. But now if we look, he's, he's listing another characteristic here. He's saying, look, with consistent contentment is present with a little and with a lot. He says whether he has everything in the world in abundance, he's content. 
when he has nothing and everything has been stripped away from him, he says, I'm content. Because he knows that God is in control. His hand is the provider. But I want to point out that word there that he, he points out that it's a knowledge. He knows. This means that it is something that has to be learned. Contentment is not simply just something when you come to Christ and you give him your life and you make him the Lord of your life, he fills this void. He fills this void of longing and, and love and grace. But he doesn't instantly make you content with your life. He's given you a piece that's been missing, which is him. But contentment is a journey. Contentment is something that you have to learn going through the highs and the lows. That you only learn by having a little and having a lot. See, God could snap his fingers right now or tomorrow or whenever. He could make us all millionaires, which would be awesome. But what would that do for us? Would that have any impact on our soul? Would it change our perspective? Would it change our hearts? No, contentment is something that dwells in the heart through God changing us. As we grow closer to him and we seek him, he continually shows us that he is more than enough in every circumstance. When he's had a little, when he's had a lot, when maybe, maybe that's you today. Maybe you've had a lot of things for a long time. And now maybe you don't have as much as you used to. What has that done for you? Has it made you bitter? Or have you been thankful for what you once had? And realized, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for me to grow closer to him. Now that these distractions are out of the way, maybe, maybe I can focus on him. But also these learning moments, these opportunities. When things are taken away from us, when we lose something. When that thing that comes our way, we're more grateful. We can have a heart and say, well, you know what? I deserve that. It's about time that I got this thing. Well, that's not a grateful heart. If anything, that's bitter. You're not content. And if anything, you've gotten what you wanted but yet you're still discontent because you think you should have gotten it a long time ago and you're unhappy about how the circumstances have played out. Now, Brandon talked about last week about surprises, okay? How many of y'all like surprises? No, eh, it depends, right? It depends on what kind of surprise. There's good surprises, there's bad surprises, right? Okay, so I wanted to talk about when I was in like middle school, right? I remember the iPod Touch had just come out, okay? Now, that was like the coolest thing on the planet. Now, to most of us, it's ancient now. But it was right when touchscreen technology was coming out, something that we have on all of our phones and all of our devices and our tablets and everything. But it was like when it was first coming out, you had an iPod that you could play games on, that you could listen to music and stuff. And I, I see some of my students like, what's an iPod, <laughs> right? No, like everybody's got iPhones, like, Music players don't exist anymore. They're, in, they're on everything that we have now, right? You don't have to worry about downloading music or anything. You just have Spotify. You just stream it, right? Anyway, so this is, it had just come out. All my friends had had it, and it was like the pinnacle. You had games like Angry Birds, which nobody plays anymore, right? You had things like, I don't know if anybody remembers, Jelly Car. No, Doodle Jump. Now, those are some, some like oddballs. Remember when Flappy Bird took the world by storm? And that caused an outrage? Yeah. So, like, those things, that, I mean, that was awesome. Everybody had to have that. Now, I was, I told my parents, that's what I wanted for Christmas. I wanted that iPod Touch, the thing that everybody had, everybody wanted. Now, I was fine. I told my parents, I was like, hey, like, I know this is an expensive gift. I know this is not some little thing. I'm okay with not getting that. You know, but this is, this is what I wanted. This was the main thing that I had asked for, right? Well, come Christmas time, this Christmas went a little different, right? So weeks leading up to Christmas, my family had just come out of the blue and said, hey, you're getting a bike. Now, to most of you, you're like, oh, any kid would love a bike, especially if they didn't have one. I didn't have one, but I was so confused. I had never asked for a bike nor in the past years that I asked for a bike, but everybody was in on it just saying, you know what, you're getting a bike. I was like, huh? 
and I just, I just went along with it, whatever. Now, how many of y'all have family members or families that prank each other? Right? Okay. Every Christmas, there's one of us that gets some kind of gag gift or some kind of prank or something. Okay. Well, this year was my turn. Okay. So they had told everyone in the family, tell them, hey, you know, you know, Bubby, Bubby, that, that's what they called me, is you're getting a bike. Okay. And I'm still super confused because I'm like, you know, I, I'm not trying to be a brat. Like, if, if I don't get the iPod Touch, that's fine. But give me something that I want, something that I ask for. If the price range is out of, out of the question, you know, that's fine. But so anyway, but they had taught me a lesson. And so come up to Christmas, you know, I was like, all right, I'm getting a bike. That's cool. They had all convinced me it would be great. I get fresh air, get some exercise. And I was also confused because I had no one in my neighborhood to go ride bikes with or hang out with. Um... Now, but now it came Christmas morning. Christmas morning, we wake up, and I look under the tree, and there's all these presents and everything. My niece and nephew, everybody's around and stuff. Actually, my nephew wasn't born yet. But um, we're looking around, and there's, I see all the presents, and then there's this big box, like big box under the tree. And I'm like, that's the bike. <laughs> that's the bike. All right, they weren't lying. It's cool. It's a bike. But I was fine. Like, I was like, all right, this is what I'm getting. No big deal, right? So they taught me to be content with whatever I'm getting, right? Well, I was told that I couldn't open that until the last thing. I couldn't open that until all the other presents were done. I was like, okay, I'll be patient. You all teach me lots of lessons here. I get it. And so we opened up all the presents, and then it finally came time. And they're like, all right, you can open it. I ripped off the wrapping paper. And sure enough, there was a bike box, a big old bike right? I was like, okay, you know, thanks guys, you know, I appreciate it, this is awesome, you know, thank you, and then my sister goes, well, why don't you open it? I looked at her with the most puzzled look on my face, because I'm like, how are we getting this home if I open it up and build it? Because we didn't have a bike rack on the car, there was no way to transport it, the only way it would fit in the car is if it was in the box, and I'm like, okay, like, sure, I'll, and, but I was like, no, that, that's, that's dumb, like, I'm not opening that, then she goes, well, you know, at least, at least look at what color it is. I was like, fine, I'll, I'll open the bike. I'm sure it's blue or whatever. I open it up, and I look inside this box. It is filled to the brim with golf clubs, weights, and dumbbells. <laughs> now, this is a kind of an insight look to the mind. That is my sister. My sister's 10 years older than me. Um, so we, we like to prank each other and those kind of things. Now, she's a great sister. Well... I look in this box, and everybody's already got their, their cameras out, filming me, laughing. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I pull out weight after weight, golf club after golf club, and then at the bottom of this box was a little white box. And in this little white box was, in fact, the iPod Touch. And my sister had bought it herself for me. You know, it was something completely unexpected, something that I was, I was content with not getting, but she taught me a very valuable lesson that day is that if I'm not content with what I have or what I may get, I'll lose the opportunity to be surprised. If I always know what I'm getting, I'll never be thankful for it. And I'll miss out on the things that God is trying to show me in miraculous ways. If I feel like I'm entitled to everything, or even if I don't get something that I want, if I'm ungrateful for the things that are provided for me, See, for many of us, that's what we miss. It's be, we become so discontent with what we don't have or how something plays out instead of seeing the purpose that it played in our life. Everything that God does in our life, that he gives to us, that he provides for us, or even doesn't provide for us, is a way to point us back to him, to show us that he is all that we need for us to rely on him and show us that he is more than enough. Those are the things that will train us, that will help us learn, that we gain that knowledge of what it means to truly be consistently content. Are you content when you don't get that job that you want? Are you content with where you're living? Are you content maybe you didn't win the house that you wanted to buy? Are you content wherever God has you, or are you constantly searching, searching for more? 
Because if we're searching for more and more of the things of this world, we're definitely not searching for more and more of Jesus. The Bible says we cannot serve God and money at the same time. Now, but it goes beyond money. It's, it's anything. The question that we have to ask and reflect on is, has God always taken care of us? Has he always provided one way or another? Even if it's not what we want. Because that's what he wants us to focus on. Because he's providing everything at all times for us. He's never, he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. See, obviously this, this thing was not a need. And we equate needs with wants many times. But see, just if he snapped and snapped his fingers and made us all millionaires, it wouldn't change a thing. If we look, David writes in Psalm 78, in verse 32, he says, In spite of all this, they still sinned. Despite his wonders, they did not believe. Now what he's talking about there is he's talking about the Israelites. He's talking about them coming out of Egypt. He says, they have seen the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He's seen the parting of the Red Seas. He's seen the plagues. They, they've seen all of these things, and they were provided for through the wilderness. They were promised the promised land. God had given them everything, but yet they were still ungrateful for everything that they had. And he says, despite them having everything and an abundance of what Jesus, God didn't have to do anything for them. But he did because he loved them. Just like he loved us and he sent his son, which is something he didn't have to do. But he says, in despite of all of that, I gave them everything and it didn't change a thing about them. Maybe us today, maybe we're worried about our situation. It could be finances, it could be relationships, it could be family, it could be a multitude of things. But if he fixes anything but your heart is not changed, if your heart stays the same, it doesn't change anything. And why is he going to bless us or give us things in abundance or even reveal his will for our lives if we're not going to be grateful for it? Because I can guarantee you, if I pitched a fit that I, I got that bike and I didn't get that iPod Touch or whatever, they would have taken it from me. They'd been like, ah, yeah, maybe two years from now. My dad would have taken it. He probably would have, like, smashed it, just being honest. <laughs> But we have to be able to be grateful for the things that God has given us. And maybe that's why we don't have the things that we think that we should or maybe the desires that we want. Maybe they don't line up with God's will. And maybe it's something that just because we have it, it won't bring us any closer to him. Every single thing in this life is to point us closer and closer to him. But see, if we continue and we look and we look at it, that he's doing all of this and we recognize his provision and we recognize that he's moving all of these things in our lives, we realize that our strength is not on ourselves. Our, strengths, our strength only resides in him to go through this life. And now we're going to look at Philippians 4.13. Now this is probably one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture next to John 3.16. For I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Right? We all know that verse for the most part. But, we t but it's, also, it's like the most, the second most famous verse, but it's like the most famous for being taken out of context. Because we think, oh yeah, it's this brute strength that he's going to, to do amazing things. He can and will do amazing things in our lives, but he's not talking about brute strength here. Okay, This word, when it's translated, this word strength is where we get the word dynamo or dynamite. Okay, So it can mean either one of the two things. Well, if it's meaning dynamite and explosive power, I'm sorry, that's not Jesus, that's just Taco Bell. <laughs> but, but now he's, what he's meaning here is that power dynamite, right? He's not talking that Paul is explosive over here, okay? He's talking about this, this sustainable energy, something that is producing continual energy in his life. His strength means more so, if anything, endurance, also known as what we say is is what we're talking about today is consistency. That he's able to consistently go through this life, endure all things, endure all of these struggles that he's gone through. 
because he has this dynamo power, this strength within him. It's not something that happens in an instant. And see, Paul is one of probably what we would consider one of the most godly people in all of Scripture. But yet, he went through some of the most horrific things within his life. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't mean that our life is going to be all peachy and it's going to be the best thing we ever want it to be. It's going to be full of challenges and uncertainties and things. But we see that everything in his life, everything that Paul went through, he didn't complain about it. He saw all of it as an opportunity. You know what? This is a challenge. It's hard right now, but I'm going to learn to be content. I know what God has given me, and I know that he's gotten me out of every single one of these situations. He's going to get me through it. He was content. But see, for us, that's hard sometimes because we don't want to feel weak. We want to be strong. We want to be bold. We want to be confident. But sometimes we're not. For us, that weakness can look like a lot of things. One thing that it should look like in many of our lives is Humility. Many of us think that pride is strength. That what we have to be on the top of, we always have to be right. In reality, that's not strength. In fact, Jesus was one of the most vulnerable people in Scripture. And he shared his heart. And what we would consider as a worldly view is weak. He was the strongest man that ever lived. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be brought low. He's saying these experiences are what shape us. We learn from them. See, when we look at Paul's life, he writes about everything that he went through in 2 Corinthians. If we look at chapter 11, starting in verse 24, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often with food, without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. See, he knew what it meant to endure all of these things. The third characteristic that he's writing about here is that he's consistently content in both strength and weakness. It doesn't matter when he was strong, when he was weak. He says he, he endured all these things, betrayal, being stoned, being shipwrecked, being left alone, starvation. But yet at the end of this, he says a key line. He says that the thing that he's most concerned about is the pressure of the anxieties he has for the church, for his friends. He says, hey, don't worry about me. I've got this under control. I've, I've got God. I've got Jesus. I know that I'm going to be okay. But he's writing for the new believers, for the churches, for his friends, who he knows that are going through similar persecution. He says, don't worry about me. Don't don't even think about it. He says, focus on them. That's where his heart was. And maybe if we took a moment to step back and we look at, well, you know, I'm going through a pretty rough time right now. But maybe we also know somebody else who's going through the same thing or has gone through the same thing but maybe we never check up on them. It's important for us to be there for each other for when those hardships come. Paul knew that even on top of Jesus being with him, he knew that he had churches and friends everywhere cheering him on, encouraging him. And he was showing them how to be content. And for us today, maybe maybe we're not content. Maybe we've talked about, you know, it's, we have that complacency of just saying, you know, I'm just going with the flow. Just, 
every day is another day. I'm okay, but you're really not. I've been there. It's okay to not be okay. But it's not okay to not be content. Because God has given us more than we could have ever asked for in his son, Jesus. Something that we didn't deserve. Something that he says, you know what, I love you. I'm going to send my son who is himself in flesh, not something separate. He said, I'm going to endure this cross, this, these nails, this crown. I'm going to endure all of that for you because I love you. Something that that, that alone should make any of us content today. But the truth is in a worldly view that most of us, that's not enough. We're always seeking, seeking for something more. See, Paul, he knows what it's like to be beaten to there's like almost nothing left of him, where he was just a shell of a man. For us today, we may not endure that physical beating, but for many of us, we know what it's like to feel like there's nothing left of us. Maybe there's someone close and dear to your heart, a loved one, someone that's been there for you your whole life, maybe a parent, maybe a sibling, heaven forbid our own child those situations are hard those situations bring us low they make us weak but are we content in knowing that God has a plan if we're able to see the moments of what he's drawing us to of how this is pointing us back to him and even pointing others back to him by our witness and how we live. We will be able to endure those situations better. We will experience the love and the grace that overwhelms us. His, his provision, we will see it in every aspect. We will see these characteristics play out from him, but also in our own lives as we develop this rhythm of contentment. Of something that's consistent. See, strength and weakness, they're two sides of the same coin. They kind of exist with one another. If you're strong, if you feel great, if you're healthy, you know what it's like to once be weak. You know where you've come from. Now, we don't ever want to maybe relive those moments. And most of the time we try to forget them. Of what has broken us. But those situations have taught us how to be strong. That we're thankful for going through it to bring us to where we are now, even though in the moment it's something that we dread, something that we hate, something that doesn't make any sense to us. But also in the same way, when we're weak, we know what it was like to once be strong. We know that when we felt like we were on top of the world, we're thankful for the opportunities that God has shaped us. We're thankful for that health, for, for feeling strong. We learn to appreciate what God has given us way more. See, we look at these things, we look at the highs and the lows, we look at a lot and a little, and we look at strength and weakness, and we see that they're a cycle. They constantly teach us to appreciate the other. And until we can appreciate both of them, of having everything and having nothing, feeling the greatest and feeling like you're worthless, you'll never appreciate anything in this life. And you'll never truly appreciate what Jesus has done for us on the cross. See, these hardships, Jesus never promised us that we would be without them. If anything, as Christians, of going through this life, of going against the grain and the current, we're going to probably endure more of them because we're choosing a different path. Something that's not easy. But C.S. Lewis wrote this quote. He says, Hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. The hardships that we endure now, they're preparing us for great things that God has planned for us. I can't speak of what God's going to do in every one of your lives, but I can speak from experience that he's going to bring you into great places if you serve him. 
He's going to show you unimaginable things and use you in ways that you never thought possible and, in fact, maybe you never thought worthy of. Maybe we've beaten ourselves up and we're in that place where we feel worthless that will never amount to anything. But no, God stamped on you that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He has a plan for each and every one of us. But for us to be able to see and experience those blessings, we have to first be content with whatever season he has us in right now. He's showing us something wherever you are, wherever you live, whatever your family looks like, wherever you're working. He's showing all of us right now that there's a place and a purpose for you being here. We have to look for the purpose. We have to look for those opportunities to learn contentment. Because until we're consistently content, not just occasionally, when we have that peace within us, that's when God starts revealing things and giving us blessings because he knows we're going to appreciate them. He knows that we're going to do the right thing with those things he has given us, and we're not going to take those things for granted. Because if we're waiting for something, let's say it's money or whatever it is, and he gives it to us, but he knows that it's going to pull us away from him, that it will become something in our vision that will blind us, that will blur us, that will pull us in the other direction, that we will no longer have our eyes on Jesus. He's not going to give it to us. Everything in this life that happens to us points to him. He doesn't make the bad things happen. That's the sin and the evil and the corruptness in this world. But he uses all circumstances for his good. We have to be willing to see what he's doing in the moment when we don't understand. Even if we're given a present that we don't understand why we're getting it, but there's a surprise behind it. There's a surprise waiting inside for, for something greater, something beyond ourselves, behind something that, that we even wanted. Because even our desires are nothing compared to what God can do for us. His dreams are greater, his plans are bigger, and we limit ourselves to what we want instead of what he wants. <clears throat> My challenge to everyone today is are you content? And I don't mean complacent. I don't mean going with the flow. I mean, do you have a peace right now where you're sitting? Wherever you're watching from, are you content? Or is there something running into your mind that you can't stop thinking about? That's worrying you. Something that you know that you need to give to him in full trust. It's not about what we can't have. It's about knowing that what all we do have. Maybe that's us today. Maybe we want to begin to experience that peace. Again, coming to Jesus does not just mean that it just happens. But coming to Jesus allows us to learn what that peace means. And maybe you want to experience that today. Maybe you want to experience the love and the joy that comes from knowing Jesus today. There's no special prayer. There's no specific thing that you have to say. It simply is saying, Jesus, I come to you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done wrong. I believe that you are the Son of God, that, you, that God, you sent your Son to die for me. Lord, I want to live for you. I want to experience everything that you have for me that takes precedence over my life. I want to make you the Lord and Savior of my life today. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you today, that's all it takes is praying that now in your seat. Don't wait another moment. Don't wait till you get home. Don't wait till next week. If you feel the Lord pulling on your heart, do it now. And if that's you today, we'd, we'd love to hear about it. If you'd write it on the back of a connection card or even just see somebody or tell somebody today, we want to come alongside you. Because that's what we're called to do and be as the church is to lift up and encourage one another. But for the rest of us, 
I pray that we examine our lives. Are we content? Are we truly consistently content in you? Does our life and what we call contentment consist of the characteristics? Are we content in the highs and the lows? Are we content with and without? Are we content when we're strong and when we're weak? Do we look for those moments to be molded and shaped by you? Or are we fueled by our own selfish desires? Lord, I pray that we all challenge our hearts, that we dive into ourselves and where we reflect. Lord, if there's anything in this life that is pulling us, that is a distraction, that is a worry and anxiety, Lord, I pray that either you point it out or you take it away. Lord, allow the only thing that we focus on and that we're worried about that could cause us discontentment is, Lord, that you pull that away from us. But Lord, allow the only thing that can make us content to be known that it is you. Lord, I pray that as we go out, Lord, we exhibit that in our lives and in our walks and our witnesses, that we show others that through the hardships, through the trials, Lord, we can be content with you. In your holy name, pray and ask it. Amen. See you all next week.